I learned about inflammatory bowel disease early in that my best friend's mother had Crohn's disease. I remember this in particular because we were always told to be quiet and not to stress her mother out when we played at her house because this would cause her mom to experience a flare-up, quote-unquote. Little did I know that there actually was a direct correlation between emotional stress and inflammatory bowel disease exacerbations. Maybe had I known at the time stress could cause a flare-up, I would have suggested she pick up yoga, maybe some counseling, learn some stress management techniques. You know, she was a little overweight, so maybe she could do a little bit more physical activity. Uh, how well would that advice be received from an eight-year-old? Oh, sigh. Don't know, but let's begin. The two most common inflammatory bowel diseases are Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, which I will continue to refer as UC. In UC, the problem lies in the rectum and in the sigmoid colon, as seen here. However, the fulament type of UC involves the entire colon, as you see here. What happens is the intestinal mucosa only um, is inflamed, causing edema and redness. Unfortunately, the increased blood flow and fluids leads to ulcers and abscesses. With thickened bowel walls, one can only imagine how small the internal lumen will get. Tiny and tinier it gets may possibly cal uh, cause a bowel obstruction, and it may even cause stool to get caught because the lumen's too small. The exact cause of UC is unknown, but they do think there is a um, direct correlation with genetics, and it is extremely prevalent within some Jewish families. With all the remissions and exacerbations of the disease, the cells happen to be severely damaged over time, and this does increase a uh, patient's risk for colon cancer. As you'll see in a future slide, hemorrhaging from ulcers, hence the word ulcerative colitis, is a major issue in this condition. Now, Crohn's disease, on the other hand, is a condition that involves all of the layers of the intestine. They call that transmural. Um, and the inflammation can occur anywhere from the mouth all the way down the anus. However, uh, most often the affected sites are the small intestines right here, uh, particularly the distal ileum and the ascending colon. They say right colon, but as you know, there's only one, but the right side or the ascending colon. Now, lesions or sections of the swollen up area are known to be spotty and sporadic or in patches, which leaves this cobblestone appearance, say on a colonoscopy finding. If you ever hear that, you know it means Crohn's. Now, unlike UC, where ulcerations cause abscesses, the problem with Crohn's disease leads to multiple fistulas. Fistulas are really small, unnatural connections between parts of the colon or bladder or vagina and or the skin. Structures caused by uh, scar tissue often result in obstructions only fixed by surgery. If you know anything about bowel surgery, you'll know that releasing or cutting scar tissue only makes more scar tissue and more strictures. It's a really vicious cycle, so we always hope to avoid going into the uh, belly for a surgery. However, I mean, sometimes these strictures and obstructions are life-threatening, and we have to go in there. Another problem with fistulas is that uh, fistulas and intestinal edema lead to severe malabsorption, sometimes to the level of debilitation. Anemia and B12 deficiency is a very common finding in Crohn's disease. Crohn's is genetic, and about 20% uh, of the patients um, are of, you know, have one relative who is positive with Crohn's, so it is strongly, um, it does run strong in the families. Also, we have found that people who use tobacco are also of Jewish ethnicity, and even folks who have, um, you know, urban living environments have been noted to develop Crohn's disease. I guess country living has its benefits. Now there is a table in your book that notes the timing of the onset of the disease, so you can reference it if you would like. Um, 
And this just kind of ex explains the differences between UC and Crohn's disease. Uh, in nursing school, I actually got the opportunity to mentor a junior nursing student, and she had Crohn's disease, I think since she was 15. When, what I remembered most about her Crohn's is that she had to take vitamin B12 shots that I believe she did either every week or every month, and that uh, she was on a very restricted diet. She was Jewish too. If that story helps you remember Crohn's disease, then it served its purpose. Now, these two diseases can easily get mixed up should you not take the time to commit to memory some of these details that we're going to review. Now, in UC, tenesmus is the instant urge to defecate and is a uh, big characteristic of UC. <clears throat> I believe in the video I included in your module, they made a joke about how tennis players get tenismus and have to run off the court to the toilet about 10 to 20 times a game. If you keep in mind which part of the UC usually affects on the colon, then you can understand that the pain occurs in the left lower uh, quadrant right over the cecum and the sigmoid area. Now remember that hemorrhaging is a major problem of UC, so it makes sense <clears throat> Excuse me. So it makes sense to see bloody stools um, and say the toilet. People with UC find their condition extremely distressing and that they have that sensation of feeling tied to the toilet. They will actually have toilet anxiety and that if they can't locate a toilet in any location that they are in, say they are unfamiliar in that particular environment, they will actually limit their life and their activities and where they go and travel. No one wants fecal incontinence, so that is completely understandable. Fever now is in severe cases and may incur in UC, but it will be a low grade fever such as 99 or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In Crohn's disease, the pain is crampy like and often found in the right upper quadrant. I mean, obviously this is where the distal ileum and the right uh, colon can be found, or the ascending colon. Signs and symptoms may greatly vary due to the disease site range and severity. Expect to find high-pitched rushing bowel sounds with low-grade fever as well. They don't have near as many stools per day, but um, you know it's still having bowel, uh, abnormal bowel patterns. The patient may even be guarded and tender on the abdomen. The stool-like the stool, like someone with cholelithiasis, will be greasy looking. You may find blood in the stool too, but definitely not as much as those who have UC. The self-imposed dietary restrictions, the malabsorption, the catabolism like nature of their condition makes them super prone to dehydration and nutrient uh, deficiencies. Well, you know UC patients pass a lot of blood in their stools, so expect the H and H to drop. The hemoglobin, which is the first H, which is normally, say, in a male 14 to 18, would be like, say, 9 or 8. The hematocrit in a male is 40 to 50 percent. Mm, we would probably see in a person with UC like a 22 or a 20. Now, just for point of reference, we typically transfuse if you're like 6 and 18 or 6 and 20, or possibly if you're symptomatic at like 8 and 25. No, this is not a test question. I'm just trying to give you some real world knowledge so you will have a real good hold on what, say, a, a, a low H and H is. So if they say 5.5 and 18, you say, oh God, this is not good at all. Get my drift. Now on the CMP, you will see a decreased sodium, a decreased chloride, and a decreased potassium. These are all low due to the de uh, dehydration, diarrhea, and the malabsorption. A MRE, or a magnetic uh, resonance enterography, <clears throat> is a good study to, to look at the bowel and to look for abscesses that may possibly appear. Unfortunately, the patient had to, has to be NPO for four to six hours, and then they get a big dose of glucagon, sub-Q, just as the test is to begin. Wait, why do, why do we give somebody with 
no diabetes glucagon. I'm so glad you asked. It's actually a side effect of glucagon, such as slowing the gut, which is desirable in this situation. It allows us to really take a good look at the bowels. Now, a colonoscopy can aid in the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis, but the bowel prep is absolutely exhausting. A barium enema can show the difference between UC and Crohn's. That's why we do this one. Now, in Crohn's disease, we have the same labs uh, and pretty much the same test. However, there are a few more extras due to the malabsorption of nutrients even though you can have that over here too. The patient will be low in vitamin B12, folic acid, and have a decreased albumin level, which I don't see listed here, but they'll have a decreased albumin level or their protein levels will be low. The urine now, if we were to test the urine, may show pyuria or pus in the urine. This is possibly due to a fistula connected with the bladder, and this is where stool has leaked into the urine and caused a UTI. If we were to do an x-ray, we will see narrowing, ulcerations, strictures, and fistulas. Let's talk about the complications of UC and Crohn's disease. The complications of both UC and Crohn's disease can be summarized in Table 57-4 on page 1174. Really, you can honestly say all of this may occur here and these may occur here. That is true, but the book does separate and explain them out a little bit under each disease like I have separated here. So do you think a person could go into hypolemic shock from ulcerative colitis? Yes. May possibly be because of the dehydration. They could also go into hypovolemic shock from blood loss, regardless if it's frank blood, which is known as overt blood in the stool, like you can see it's red blood in the stool, or if you see melana, which means a person has black tarry stool. A patient in general will be pale, they'll have, be hypotensive, they'll have fast respirations, tachycardic, they'll be dizzy, and they may even pass out a lot on you. Um, let's speak to the toxic megacolon. Kind of sounds like a, uh, a super villain there. <clears throat> Toxic metacolon is a massive dilation of the colon that can lead to a gangrenous bowel and peritonitis. In this situation, antibiotics have to be given. You have to make the patient NPO. You must start IV fluids and even steroids to suppress the immune system. Surgery is a possibility as a rotting bowel inside someone is no good. Um, rupture. Colon cancer is likely in both disorders, so instead of the typical colonoscopy screenings that we do for folks who are greater than 50 years of age, those who have UC should get checked in about 10 years of the onset of the uh, condition. And those can, uh, who have Crohn's can wait a little bit longer, like maybe 15 to 20 years because their issue is mainly in the small bowel. However, they still need to get checked out for malignancies. For Crohn's disease, expect strictures, abscesses, and fistulas, as all of the layers are swollen and irritated. The bad thing about fistulas is that they are constantly draining, they never heal, and they are dehydrating the patient even further than what they already are dehydrated. The poor nutrition makes them way more susceptible to infections and they may need uh, TPN or total parenteral nutrition. We can feed the gut in Crohn's disease, but it's got to be uh, Nivenex. The reason for this is because it's readily digested by the upper half of the small intestine. Those fistulas may even need to have a wound vac placed on it. I don't know the exact dollar amount, but let me just tell you, those are not cheap. In fact, when I was at Sacred one time, uh, a patient accidentally took one home and was not able to be contacted, and the hospital had to replace one, and it was, I believe, $18,000 to buy a whole new wound back. So uh, don't discharge a patient with that, will you? Let's see. So um, 
If you have a cutaneous fistula, inspect skin integrity to be damaged and excoriated and maybe even yeast-like, so you may have to get some um, antifungal medication for it if they do develop a rash. Ever had so much diarrhea that left you raw down there? Well, imagine that at the site of the fistula exit wound. Mm -mm -mm. Since perforation is likely, watch for belly pain, fever, increase in white blood cells, and even changing mental status. The person may go septic on you quite quickly, uh, which means that the intestinal bacteria has gotten and migrated into the bloodstream. Is this lethal? Answer is yes, because all of the organs become contaminated with the bacteria that's supposed to be in the intestines and they subsequently fail and a person can die. So during exacerbation, um, you know, the patients typically in the hospital always be looking for signs and symptoms of peritonitis, um, which can be a result of the bowel rupturing, perforation, which is basically the same thing. Uh, remember those signs and symptoms? Yes, it's bored like abdomen, tachycardia, fever, nausea, vomiting, and I guess even hiccups. Now, osteoporosis. This is the result of long-term use of corticosteroid use. Unfortunately, basically you have to take a, this, you know, you have to take a drug such as prednisone that cures your um, ulcerative colitis or your Crohn's disease However, it causes another problem, such as osteoporosis. I call that a bummer. Okay. Let's go up here. Sulfadazoline or a sulfid sulfidine is taken to treat mild to moderate UC as it starts to work in about two to four weeks. You got to ask the patient though about their allergies to meds before starting this drug as patients who are allergic to sulfa may have a cross sensitivity and are likely to react to this medication. Emphasis in the word sulfadalazine. Mm. This patient also uh, must not be on a thiazide diuretic such as hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ. Now, what if a patient does have an allergy to sulfa drugs? Not a problem. You can use the non-sulfa version of this drug called mesalamine or acicol. Mesalamine can be given orally or rectally. Now, steroids are used. Here we go. Steroids are used a lot for both UC and Crohn's and that both conditions are a result of an overstimulated immune response and suppressing the immune system temporarily during an exacerbation is in a dire, uh, desired effect uh, which can meet the patient's need. Now, what happens when you take steroids? You remember in COPD what happens? You have to uh, manage their hyperglycemia the patient has an increased chance for peptic ulcers, so make sure you take this medication with food, report heartburn, probably take a, a heartburn medication. And obviously, if we suppress the immune system, you are possibly going to catch a bug a little bit easier than if not and get some sickness such as pneumonia or flu. So stay away from people who are sick or large crowds. But hey, when your colon and small intestines are inflamed and raging, I guess it's a win for the intestine and the body's just got to go with it. Now, immunomodulators. Uh, immunomodulator injections are a new and upcoming class of drugs for all kinds of autoimmune problems for diseases like psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, UC, lupus, cancer treatments, etc. If you watch enough TV and you see some commercials, Catch how many drugs are being advertised um, that end in MAB, M-A-B. An example would be infliximab, or also known as Remicade, or um, Adalimumab, also known as Humira. When used with steroids, a patient can see quicker results and improve faster because the immune system, immune system is desensitized, the white blood cells. That's a good thing because um, now it's going to quit attacking itself. 
and yes, we are going to have an increased risk for infection, or we may have latent TB become activated. Um, this is always a possibility when somebody is on immunomodulator meds. Now, we already talked about some nutrition concerns with UC and Crohn's, but do know that TPN is rich in electrolytes, vitamins, and calories, and you can overdo it for a person. Uh, so a pharmacist has to literally write the prescription out and change the formula every day. They make slight adjustments to the formula prior to you uh, hanging it up there. This stuff is super expensive and can only hang for 24 hours. They may have lipids mixed in or the lipids may hang separately and be run in concurrently, uh, which means all at once. Now, can they have lipids um, and develop hyperlipidemia from this? Yes. So frequently you may have to do a lipid panel and see if the person has a high LDL or total, uh, excuse me, or triglyceride level. Now, if you had a choice between feeding the gut Vivanex or feeding the veins straight nutrition, what do you think would be the best thing? How do you feed the person the best way? The answer is the gut. You want to try, if you can, give a person Vivanex. The gut plays a huge role in synthesizing its own vitamins, such as vitamin K, not to mention it does make good bacteria and plays a role in someone's immune system. So always try to get the gut food first. If you can't, because somebody's exacerbation is so severe, you're going to have to give them TPN. Now for food choices for the diet there, should we put a patient with UC or Crohn's um, on a regular diet where they can have caffeine or maybe even alcohol or carbonated beverages or maybe they're allowed to eat raw veggies or other high fiber foods um, including pepper, nuts, corn, dried fruits? Hmm. I have all products containing lactose uh, such as milk or maybe even gluten um, non-gluten-free bread? That would be a no. I'm not going to say an absolute no. It really just depends on how severe this person's case is, but these items here that I just mentioned are considered GI stimulants, which may cause cramping and pain. So the suggestion is to be, uh, you know, have a, communi have a conversation with your patient and put them on a low-fiber, bland diet, and they can introduce food a little bit at a time and see what they can tolerate. Now, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. let's say meds are not working for a person and, uh, and a person is beginning to make fistulas or abscesses all over their abdomen. We need to temporarily or even permanently disconnect the bowel from the disease section and let the healthy section drain into a pouch, such as a ostomy. Uh, ostomy bag. Say what? Yes siree. Uh, for UC patients, uh, they can have a two-step procedure where the colon is removed, but the anus and the anus sphincter stays. The patient temporarily gets an ileostomy, and then the small intestine in so many months will be stretched back down to the bottom of the abdomen and reconnected to the anal canal and anus. Bowel control is often pretty decent due to the J pouch that the surgeon has created. Just FYI, ileostomy drainage is typically bright green and watery, or maybe even a bright yellow color. It's not called diarrhea when it comes out like this from the ileostomy. We actually call it effluent. Over time, um, the body compensates and it will become a bit thicker, but do know any patient who has an ileostomy is at risk for dehydration. So salt intake and fluid intake is considered okay if we want to increase it, especially if the person is experiencing periods of sweating, such as when they're working out in the heat or in the yard, or maybe they're exercising, or maybe they're sick. Uh, we want them increasing their salt and fluid intake. They can go back to eating normal food, but may want to stay away from gas warming foods, such as raw cabbage, corn, celery, you know, popcorn, nuts. 
double check table 57-4 for all of your ostomy do's and don'ts, such as when do I empty it? Maybe when it's a third to a half full, or to change the bag every three to five days. Maybe avoid enteric coated meds. Uh, on that note, um, I didn't think about it when I gave a patient three enteric coated potassium chloride pills. And then next thing you know, about three hours later, the pill popped out inside the ileostomy bag, just as intact with everything still on it, uh, the writing even. The GI tract was literally too fast, it couldn't even begin to break down the coating on the tablet. I had to call the doctor and let them know the finding and that I was uh, gonna request the liquid version of the medication. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't know how much medicine was absorbed, even though I could see the pill was still intact. So we actually redrew the potassium, got the result, and then we uh, went from there. Sounds fun, huh? Um, now Crohn's disease care is much like UC care. The two additional meds that you see here are really for severe Crohn's disease. Severe Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease patients, if not NPO or on Vivanex, do need high calorie, high protein, high vitamin, and low fiber diets. Due to the high risk of malnutrition, be on the lookout for weight loss and unbalanced eyes and O's, such as they're drinking some, but um, nothing's coming out. Even low vitamin B12. They may have to give themselves those injections at home, to be honest. Now, resection surgery would be treated like any other abdominal surgery. The person needs to deep breathe, cough, splint their incision, do their incentive spirometer, walk to prevent DVTs, use their um, you know, sequential compression devices. They need to take it easy on their diet, such as eating low fiber foods. Um, they need to learn how to care for an ostomy, like uh, when to call a physician, say if it's purple, white, or blue color, or maybe even prolapsed, but that means it's flipped out. It should be a nice uh, cherry red to even a... Go now, young grasshopper and ponder about something else.